All righty, everybody, welcome back to the Ultrasound Grand Rounds this week. Pretty excited to be here as we continue on through this uh, fall semester. The weather is changing, uh, which means we're going to get fall colors here pretty soon. Uh, but today, to uh, present with us today, I have brought back a friend of this channel, Dr. Ashish Anesia. Uh, Ashish is one of our cardiologists here at Metro Health, and we are going to be talking a little bit about advanced Doppler ultrasound for pericardial tamponade. It's a pretty exciting topic. Uh, things that we have um, that are easy to do, well, not easy to do, but you know, things that are doable at the bedside, uh, but in, and can also provide some information for our clinic or patients clinically. But we need to know how to apply it and the nuances that apply. And so Ashish is going to help us out with that. And so let's dive on in. You ready? You want to do yeah. this thing? All yeah, right. Absolutely. So I have Ashish right here. We're going to switch on over to our presentation first, though, uh, and talk a little bit about. Um, pericardial tamponade in general, um, just to kind of get us all on the same speed, and then talk about this whole idea um, of adding Doppler and how that can help us in our assessment. So first off, let's just kind of briefly overview a little bit of uh, this whole idea of tamponade, right? So tamponade is basically a phenomenon that happens when you have a pericardial effusion. So we've talked in the past about pericardial effusions, and you can look at our previous videos on the YouTube channel for that. But just kind of as a little bit of a reminder, you know, we've classified these effusions as, as trivial, where they have just a small amount of fluid, but it is obliterated in that pericardial space when the when the heart reach, achieves its maximum size in diastole. And then small effusions is when you actually retain some of that, the visualization of some of that fluid around the pericardial space when the heart is as big as it can get in diastole. Uh, if it's less than a centimeter, and then one to two centimeters is that moderate range, and large is, is over two centimeters. And we've talked about that before. I think, Ashish, you've been on here talking with us um, about how to assess that and manage that. Uh, but this alone doesn't necessarily um, describe or define tamponade, right? You can't say, well, it, the effusion's this big, and so therefore it must be tamponade. Um, there's really a time element that's involved too. And so this is the, the graph that was originally published in the New England Journal um, article about pericardial tamponade. I highly recommend that article uh, for your for your reading uh, offline, but it also gets referenced in multiple papers that we've read. I know we looked up the ASE guidelines today. Uh, there's a paper that I read this last week, and this 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 graph or this picture is in all of these. And basically, what it's illustrating is the idea that tamponade happens when an effusion develops beyond a size that the pericardial space can absorb, like the the the, the little amount of stretch that the pericardial or pericardium has beyond that ability to absorb it. And when that happens, it compresses the ventricles to the point where the ventricles can't fill. And if they can't fill, then they can't then emit their blood uh, to create the cardiac output that you need either on the right side or the left side, depending on kind of where we're at in the process. And so you can imagine scenarios where if you have this slow developing um, effusion, it's going to take a lot longer and a lot more volume to get to that tamponade tight or tamponade um you know, scenario. Whereas if you have someone who rapidly fills, you know, trauma setting and things like that, the the blood in the pericardial space, you're going to achieve that, that critical tamponade a lot sooner because that pericardium just cannot absorb that stretch. And I think this is a concept that if you can kind of, we'll plant that seed now that the pericardium is decently fixed in its volume, right? There's maybe just a teeny tiny little bit of stretch to it, but for the most part, it's a decently unstretchable thing uh, in the acute phase. And so this is going to become critically important as we talk through kind of some of the physiology that underlies the Doppler findings that we're going to see later. Uh, so kind of keep that one in mind. But as we kind of move along on this basic overview, remember, each chamber in the heart has a basic pressure, right? It's, it's systolic pressure and it's diastolic pressure, more or less, right? The, the lowest pressure that it sees and the highest pressure that it sees. Uh, and so it's obviously going to be the lowest on the right side in the right atrium, right? That's going to be the, we want it to be really, really low. So blood just preferentially just pours into that right atrium to fill the heart. A little higher in the RV because we got to pump it through the, you know, the um, the pulmonary circulation. There's some, you know, resistance in the pulmonary circulation that you need to overcome to get that that um, that fluid through the lungs and back to the left side. And obviously the left side's got to overcome the systolic vascular resistance of the entire body, right? And so we need to have much higher pressures on the left side to be able to incorporate, you know, um, you know that blood or get that blood to keep moving, right? So as we start, <laughs> excuse me, as we start achieving or equaling and exceeding these various different chamber pressures with the pressure that's you know exerted on the heart from the fluid inside the pericardium, that pericardial effusion, then we're going to start seeing decreased filling. And so if we think about it in the context of this graph, 
we can see that yellowish line at the bottom is your right atrial pressure. The red line is your pericardial pressure. And as that at that inflection point where your fluid in the pericardium is exerting more pressure than the right atrium has to fill, that's when we start seeing a beginning of that downward slide where our cardiac output starts to drop, our mean arterial, arterial pressure start to drop. And that there is the beginning stages of um, the thing that we call pericardial tamponade, right? It's that, that continuum, uh, that phenomenon where we just lose our ability to achieve cardiac output uh, from our heart because of the extrinsic compression on that heart from the pericardial fluid, right? And so when we think about our basic ultrasound findings, and again, if you want more detail on this, go back to the YouTube channel. We got a video on this. Um, you can take a look at that where we elaborate on this more, but just the basic findings what we're then going to see is findings on the 2D ultrasound that are reflective of that inability to fill, right? And we'll see it first with RA systolic collapse, right? We may also see it first with a plethora of the IVC, where you just cannot get that blood as it's coming back to the heart in, right? And then when the RA is trying to refill, it's just having a hard time refilling before we can kind of uh, overload that or uh, exceed that pericardial pressure into the RA. And that's going to progress on down the spectrum to diastolic collapse of the RV, where that pressure is going to that pericardial pressure is going to exert a force on the the right ventricle, and that right ventricle is not going to be able to fill as efficiently, right? And it's going to take a little bit of extra time, extra oomph, to get that blood to fill the RV, right? And we're going to see that diastolic collapse um, in the RV, and eventually, just the whole RV is just obliterated because it just can't fill, right? And so here's a couple examples of that, right? This um, right atrial systolic collapse, where you can see it's just, it's, it's taking that extra little bit of time to get that wall to pop back out as the RA is just trying to fill, right? If you want to look at the RV side, right? Here's that diastolic collapse, where it just takes that extra amount of energy and filling to get that RV wall to pop back out um, because of the pressure exerted by that pericardial fluid. And here's another example. Uh, this is a trauma example where you can just see that kind of that that trampoline-like effect of the RV, um, that's the diastolic collapse. And then, you know, every talk would be, um, you know, missing something if we didn't at least mention the IVC. And so here's an example of the IVC plethora. I think by definition, it's like a plethora is 2.1 centimeters uh, in diameter and then less than 50% collapse with inspiration. Most of the time we just eyeball and say, oh, boy, that looks big, or it collapses down into to virtually nothing. And so that can be kind of a helpful assessment, right? And then if we think about tamponade itself, right, there's a clinical test that we can apply. And I'm only going to talk briefly about this because it does kind of come back in uh, with the Doppler kind of explaining the physiology of it. But the clinical test that we can think about is this thing called pulses paradoxes, right? And it's basically when you have this tamponade physiology, right? you have this exaggeration of the normal variation of systolic blood pressure when you breathe in and you breathe out, right? And we'll get into why that happens in just a little bit here. But essentially, assuming ideal conditions, which I know everything in the in the ED is 100% not ideal conditions, right? But if assuming ideal conditions, you had continuous blood pressure monitoring, and you didn't have any other factors that were affecting, you know, your blood pressure variability and things to that effect, if you can monitor your patient, say, breathe in now and watch the blood pressure, you know, change, and then breathe out now and watch the blood pressure change, if that inspiratory expiratory variation exceeds 10 millimeters of mercury, that's technically a positive pulses paradoxes sign, uh, and is suggestive of tamponade in this, you know, particular clinical scenario, right? And so. I think as we kind of think through that, you know, this is kind of the idea that we're going to start uncovering with some of these uh, these Doppler findings. But really to understand the Doppler, I think we have to dive down into a little bit of physiology, right? Because, um, you know, the, the Doppler is just a whole bunch of squiggly lines until we understand why the body's doing what it's doing to make that Doppler happen. And so with that being said, I want to introduce this concept of uh, ventricular interdependence. And then we're going to bring Ashish in to kind of help explain some of this. So um, maybe just at a very basic level, I'll define it, right? And kind of explain it. And then Ashish can kind of add in that nuance. But by definition, ventricular interdependence is something that, you know, it, it exists, right? It happens. This is normal, right? But it's a fun phenomenon whereby the distensibility or the function of one ventricle alters the filling in the function or the distensibility in the filling of another ventricle. And I know it's just kind of like a mouthful and a word salad 
Um, so maybe let's explain it a little bit differently. Um, and then we can put in some pictures and Ashish will help um, tease out some of the nuances here. So we can really have a solid understanding of this thing called ventricular interdependence, right? So basically, as we breathe, right, there's pressure dynamics that change inside the chest that affect the heart, right, at a very fundamental level. And we've talked about this before, but when you take a breath in, take that deep breath in, right, you expand your rib cage, you flatten out your diaphragm. What you're doing essentially is creating a negative intrathoracic pressure. It's just making that negative. Okay. This obviously draws air in. It's the, it's the way it was designed to do what it's supposed to be doing. But in addition to drawing air into the chest, it also draws blood back into the chest from the IVC, right? And so we increase our venous return transiently as we take this negative intrathoracic pressure until all the pressure just kind of normalize and equalize, right? What this does to the heart is it increases the filling of the right ventricle, right? And when you increase the filling of the right ventricle, right, that's going to have a pressure effect, exert a pressure effect on the left ventricle because it's kind of inside that pericardial space that's relatively, you know, contained, right? It's going to have a pressure effect on the left ventricle and decrease the LV filling, right? So as one fills, one, one filling goes up, the other filling goes down, right? And the same is true with expiration, right? As you breathe out, right, you're pushing that diaphragm back up, the ribs are collapsing back down, you increase that intrathoracic pressure so that you can expel that air out of your lungs, right? It also says, well, you know, there's a higher pressure in that chest, it's harder to get blood back in. So the venous return to the heart, you know, goes down, RV filling goes back down, right? And this has a the effect of allowing the LV to like, oh my goodness, I got a little bit more room in here now. And the LV can fill back up, right? And have just a slightly increased LV filling. And so we have this seesaw back and forth between the RV and the LV. And so with that being said, I'm going to just put this picture up here and then really kind of let Ashish kind of explain a little bit more from a cardiology perspective and kind of how this, you know, how this happens a little bit more. And, um, so, yeah, I don't know if you want to add a little bit to that, that conversation here. Well, I think you were very, very comprehensive, Matt. I don't have a lot to add at this stage, but, you know, I'll have more uh, to talk about in subsequent slides. Um, that said, I think one of the things that you really mentioned, which is very important, is the question of interdependence. Uh, which is normally present, but it gets exaggerated in patients with um, cardiac tamponade. Um, you, you can also get interdependence in patients that don't have tamponade, uh, which is important to understand. Uh, tamponade does not occur in the absence of pericardial fluid. So in order for tamponade to be present, you need the presence of pericardial fluid. But in certain individuals, you can have constrictive pericarditis with fluid, which is effusive constrictive physiology. I'm getting a little bit more into the weeds at this time, but it's it's, it's important to understand that uh, constriction is even more likely than uh, tamponade to have, to result in a state of interdependence. Um, so you could have plain constriction where there's no fluid, or you can have effusive constrictive where you have fluid and a thickened and very inelastic and sometimes calcified pericardium that prevents filling and it tends to exaggerate the interventricular dependence. Um, one of the reasons why that happens is, be is because the intrathoracic pressure does not get through into the intrapericardial space. And the intrapericardial space is uh, sort of sealed off completely from the changes in pressure that occur in the intrathoracic space. And that kind of makes it worse. In patients that have uh, marked respiratory distress from, say, a severe COPD or asthma exacerbation, you could get pulsus paradoxus, you could get interdependence, uh, but of course you don't have a pericardial effusion. Um, you can also get it in patients with an acute pulmonary embolism where you have a severely reduced right ventricular uh, function and also reduced capacitance of the pulmonic circulation, and that tends to exaggerate this, this phenomenon as well. So of course, in that situation, you do not have uh, the presence of a pericardial effusion. In rare circumstances, a large pleural effusion with a small pericardial effusion can also lead to signs of tamponade. Uh, that we don't see very often. We don't even suspect it, but a large pleural effusion with a small pericardial effusion in combination can produce the same physiology as a large pericardial effusion alone. So I just wanted to mention that. So it seems like, you know, kind of hearing you talk about this, the things that cause the exaggeration of this ventricular interdependence is then things that prevent the, the compliance of the heart and that, that very little compliance that the pericardial sac would have. And so if we put fluid in it, if we kind of calcify the thing, if we kind of kind of put concrete around it, you know, like 
since that becomes then even less compliant, we're going to exaggerate the effect. I mean, is that a Absolutely. reasonable way of thinking about it? Completely agree. The, the way tamponade is different from every other condition, which is important to emphasize, is that the chamber volume goes down in tamponade, right? So in mm -hmm. constriction, the chamber volume may not be markedly different. But in tamponade, since there's no place for blood to fill, everything in the heart gets smaller. So the heart chambers may appear thicker than normal. They may appear hypertrophied because essentially they're underfilled, right? So what is going on is that there's prevention of diastolic filling of the heart, right? So what you're trying, what the heart is trying to do is raise diastolic filling pressures in all the four chambers as it's trying to encounter the increased uh, resistance to filling, which is being posed by the pericardial space, right? So when pericardial fluid starts to fill up, it actually increases the pressure in the pericardial space, which is usually negative during inspiration and just rises above positive in expiration. But it, when you start to get to a positive pressure, which is usually, uh, if it gets above 10, then you definitely have tamponade, right? So the intrapericardial pressure, as long as it's below 10, uh, you may not have signs of tamponade. But if it reaches above 10, you're clearly going to have <clears throat> the inability to fill the right atrium because the right atrial diastolic pressure is anywhere from zero to four millimeters of mercury. So now you will see evidence of right atrial collapse in ventricular systole or right ventricular right atrial diastole, right? So you want to look for it at a certain stage of the cardiac cycle that we will talk about. And as the pericardial pressure increases further, you have the the body requires an even higher diastolic filling pressure in all four chambers for functioning to occur. And at a certain point, diastolic filling can shut off completely and the patient can go into PEA and have no filling and of course, no coronary perfusion. So you not only have extrinsic compression, but you also have a marked decline in systemic uh, vascular pressures mm -hmm. uh, because the coronaries are no longer perfusing. Initially, there is compensation by increased vasoconstriction. So when the patient has initial tamponade, the blood pressure is maintained by marked vasoconstriction. But with the cardiac uh, perfusion dropping, all of this changes, you go into a vicious cycle, and that's how patients die in this condition. So let's let's illustrate this, I guess, in another way here. Um, so this is an M-mode image. Uh, that basically shows, and this is an article that I that I read about this phenomenon this this week, um, but it shows basically M mode through the heart uh, in the parasternal long axis window, right? And so, um, just to kind of explain things here, I mean, you obviously see in the red letters the uh, expiration, the inspiration, uh, and you can see the RV and the LV, uh, the black stripe that's that's marked as RV and LV. And so, what you see is an expiration. Uh, the the RV stripe is smaller, right? The LV or RV stripe is bigger in um, in inspiration, and the LV stripe is bigger in expiration and bigger in inspiration. So this is an example, um, a Doppler or not Doppler, but a, a, an M mode example of this ventricular interdependence that that we've been talking about. And I guess you know the, the other question bef to to get at before we move on to the abnormal Doppler assessment, right? Is you know, obviously this, we're describing this as just a normal phenomenon that happens in you and me, like it's happening right now, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so if I were to go do an M mode, you know, of you, of me right now, what would be considered like a normal variation, you know, that we should expect kind of as we, um, yeah. you know, as, as we evaluate people? Yeah, so it, it, de it depends, right? So for the most part, um, it's hardly noticeable. So if I took a long loop of your heart in the four chamber view, for example, um, and ask you to take some deep breaths uh, and then expire. I might see some shifts, but usually it's less than 5%, right? Okay. So if it is more than 5%, it starts to turn noticeable on the imaging, but less than 5%, you can barely, you barely notice it. So even with exaggerated breathing, you'll just see small changes in ventricular volumes. You won't see significant changes because there's tremendous capacitance of both the pulmonary and the systemic circulating to accommodate the fluid. Um, yeah, you will see some change, but less than 5% really is, is within normal limits. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So let's let's dive into um, a little bit of the Doppler assessment, right? And, and kind of apply this towards, I mean, I guess some of the Doppler assessment will be, you know, there'll be a normal range, right? But then as we kind of exceed normal ranges, that's going to be suggestive of, of tamponade, right? And so 
Um, where can we look with Doppler to assess essentially this concept of ventricular interdependence, right? Yeah, so you can do Doppler in essentially about four or five different places, right? So when I say Doppler, we mean most of the times we mean pulsate Doppler, right? Which localizes velocities to the point where you're sampling the blood volume. Um, the most commonly used sites are the uh, tricuspid valve, just above the tricuspid valve or the mitral valve, um, and the hepatic veins or the alveolar flow tract. You could use the superior vena cava. It's hard to get, and it's not routinely used in clinical practice. So those are essentially the four places where you can actually do Doppler assessments. The important thing to remember is that when you're looking for uh, changes in respiratory flow, you got to have the respirometer turned on. So you can you should be able to see where inspiration is happening and where is expiration happening. You need to have a properly functioning EKG lead because you need to be able to see uh, to track the cardiac cycles and divide them into systole and diastole. Uh, the third thing to do is to change the sweep speed. So your sweep speed has to be slow at about 25 millimeters per second. Uh, if you run it at the usual sweep speed that, uh, that M-mode runs or Doppler runs, you're going to have uh, very few complexes within a frame and you will not be able to discern the differences between systole and diastole. So those are the things that you really need to do before you actually even attempt this. Um, and the patient has to be steady, uh, doesn't have to hold their breath, of course, because the whole point of doing this is to show respiratory variation. Um, so those are the basics before you start. Gotcha. So let's look through a couple examples here in a sec. But I guess for our our machines and our department, anyone who's working in the ED, um, you know, we have, it's actually really convenient. We have a module underneath the keyboard, right? And it accepts the same universal EKG plug as uh, our monitors on the wall. And so it's really great. You can walk in. It, I mean, it probably drives the nurses nuts because now it starts alarming out in the, the tele box outside. But you can basically unplug the, the tele box the, the ECG leads from the telebox and just plug it straight into your, your echo. Sure. Um, and so it's great. Like we don't have to carry extra wires. Yeah. Uh, we can just plug it right back in. I have to figure out the interferometer one. Cause that's, um, you know, I haven't tried that one, yeah. but we can definitely do that. And then the sweep speed, you know, there's obviously easy settings, but yeah, it makes sense. I mean, you want to see, you know, complexes over a long period of time, right. You know, want to see it over 10, 20 seconds if you can, uh, because if you just do that, brief short one that's default, you're only going to get, you know, like the inspiratory effort portion or the expiratory portion you can't compare. Um, so yeah, those are, those are great points um, in terms of how to do it. Uh, so let's look at a few of these, right? So here's an example of the tricuspid inflow variation. So uh, basically what we're doing is we're placing our Doppler calipers, um, you know, through the tricuspid valve. Now, I guess where I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, where I would think to put it, if I want to do inflow is right um, you know, where the, the valve kind of opens up and you put it like right here. And so you kind of, tips. yeah, get the, so you, you don't get the snap of the leaflets. If you can avoid them, you kind of get that max velocity as it's coming right through the leaflets. And you, um, can, you can adjust the pulse volume location to see where you get the most optimal tracing. Sure. And then go from there. Yeah. Now, is there a kind of a general rule of thumb? Like here's, you know, you can see the, um, you know, I put the arrow in basically to show, you know, the inspiratory and the expiratory E wave, right? And so remember, you know, your, your filling wave and then your atrial kick. So the E wave and the A wave, we've talked about that in other videos. You can go take a look at that. Okay. Um, so we're going to measure E wave to E wave, mm -hmm. right? Just kind of for clarification, not E wave right. to A wave or A wave no, to A wave. It's e to e, yeah. um, so is there kind of a general rule of thumb of which E wave to select? Yeah. yeah. So you want to pick the first E wave in expiration, right? So what tends to happen is that the E wave that follows the highest E wave and in inspiration on the right side is going to be the smallest E wave, right? So the E wave that is the one that follows the highest E wave in inspiration, your first E wave in expiration is the one that you want to use as the reference point, right? So as shown here, where the tip of the arrow is, is the E wave you want to use as your reference point, and then you work backwards to the preceding complex. And that's going to be your end inspiratory P wave. So the way you calculate this is you calculate the height of the E wave, right, from the baseline to the point where the arrow tip is at, and then subtract the, the length of the E wave or the height of the E wave in the preceding complex and then divide it by the height of the E wave in expiration where the arrow head is at. So E expiration minus E inspiration divided by E expiration is how you calculate that ratio. And you do it the same on both the tricuspid and the mitral side. 
uh, and yeah. Yeah, and so I guess if you want to think about it, um, not in the form of a, a, a formula, if you want a more of a, a qualitative explanation, it's basically the percent change from the the, the highest uh, to the lowest, essentially. Yeah. Um, and theoretically, if all things are are standardized, all variables are standardized, the highest one should be, um, you know, where she said, and the lowest one should be where she says. Now, I guess the the question that comes up, um, okay let's not let perfect be the enemy of good right if we don't have like an inspirometer could w would it be reasonable you know to say hey we're just going to run the sweep speed for a period of time get yeah. 10 20 seconds and then we're going to find the highest one yeah and then the lo corresponding lowest one sure. and just calculate off that and say we get that it's may not perfect but you know yeah, I think be that's, fine. that's a workaround that you can certainly use i mean because what else could be causing that variation right you've shown the effusion you've shown the variation Essentially, that's what's going on. Yeah. It is the first beat after the highest beat, which is going to be your lowest value, yeah. al almost always. Uh, so that's what you're showing here on the tricuspid flow. And I guess the the one caveat that I can think of, and maybe you can think of a couple others, is you have to start with a very clean Doppler signal to begin with, right? Yes. And it'll, like if the patient's moving around, or you're moving around, you're having a hard time getting that, you could easily reproduce that by just slightly shifting your your axis of incination just slightly. And so I guess one of the things that I would want to look for if I'm either doing it or QAing it or teaching it at, in real time at bedside is are the peaks consistent with one another? Like yeah. if I would look through very, like two or three respiratory cycles, right. do all the peaks seem about the same? Do all the valleys seem about the same? And if so, I would consider that to be a clean tracing to, to go off of. Correct, I right? agree. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things you got to be careful about is then patients with frequent premature atrial beats or ventricular beats uh, you may not see this consistent relationship. Uh, of course, in patients with atrial fibrillation, you don't have the ASCO, that one. and E's are going to be different with every beat, so you cannot use this principle there. And you don't want to put too much emphasis on this either, because this is an ancillary finding. Uh, the most important findings to make the diagnosis of tamponade are your hep your IVC plethora, your chamber collapse. And if you have these over and above that, then it helps support your diagnosis. You're not going to have tamponade in the absence of chamber collapse or just IVC plethora. You can have cases where you have no IVC plethora in low pressure tamponade, which have chamber collapse and also have transmitral and transtricuspid flow variation. So you can have low pressure tamponade where the IVC plethora is not present. So you have to make a careful diagnosis uh, and make sure that you're looking at uh, all the parameters. So if the patient comes in with diarrhea vomiting and they have a pericardial effusion and they don't have IVC plethora, but they have right atrial collapse, okay, or they have right ventricular diastolic collapse and they have transtricuspid or transmitral flow variation and a, or a combination of the above, then you start getting concerned about tamponade, right? Sure. So you can have all those kinds of things. On the other hand, you could have a patient with severe pulmonary hypertension where your PA pressure is really high, your right atrial pressure is always 20, 25 millimeters of mercury. Now your pericardial pressure has to be above that, right? Yeah. For the chamber to tamponade. So you may not see any evidence of chamber collapse, right? Until a very late stage in patients that have severe pulmonary hypertension or right ventricular hypertrophy or right ventricular um, uh, systolic and diastolic hypertension. So those are the some of the things that you have to be careful about. Again, you won't see it all the time, but it's it's good to know those problems do exist. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I was thinking about this. Um maybe we'll take a little bit of a, a rabbit trail here for a sec. You know, I think if you pick any field of study, right? Um any anything, right? Um there are some basic rules that you need to know to do that thing, right? Um, but then when you become an expert at that thing, um, you understand that the rules apply, but there's nuance to that and how to then apply that nuanced rule in various different situations. And I think this is kind of the same thing. Like, um, generally speaking, we have less than 40% variation in the tricuspid inflow, right? And if gen and generally speaking, if you have greater than 40% variation in tricuspid inflow, you're probably in a tamponade state, assuming you did it right and all that stuff. But that also requires you to have that effusion. It also requires some of the other 2D findings. Yeah. And so if you're running out of the room saying, oh my goodness, I got 
41% variation on my tricuspid inflow. I need to call Ashish and talk to him about this tamponade patient, but fail to realize that they have zero effusion. Yeah. You know, you may be technically right on the 41%, but you kind of whole, miss the whole boat in terms of the clinical picture. And so I think I agree with you what you're saying. Like, as we learn more about these things, it's really cool to be able to do advanced things, right? You feel good about kind of knowing that basic level and the next level sure. but until you kind of know man how do i nuance this finding or understand or incorporate this finding into the whole picture you know that's kind of what separates the you know an advanced user from a novice user so uh, i don't know rabbit rabbit trail aside um we, we're talking about the tricuspid inflow variation so less than 40 percent is typically considered normal greater than 40 percent at least per you know one article that i i read i know we talked about this and tried to find the exact number per, per ase um, but for one article we mentioned was 40%. The same phenomenon applies for mitral inflow variation. And so um, I guess maybe just to, to be thorough in explanation, you know, you have your mitral valve leaflets, they open, you want to put that pulse wave gate like right at the leaflet tips, right? And this one's a lot, we do this a lot more because uh, there's you know, some literature about using mitral inflow velocities for, for other things. Like if you could talk about volume assessments, you know, you can look at look at that as well. Um, but here we want to look for mitro inflow variation of greater than 25%. Um, kind of all the same techniques apply, you know, that we just talked about with, with, um, with tricuspid. And then the last one just kind of mentioned today um, is this aortic outflow track uh, variation. And I'm sorry, this arrow is going in some completely random direction. So it doesn't necessarily correspond with, uh, with shows, what we're trying to describe. It's a nice trend. I mean, yeah, I and mean, I think I was trying to go for those first three complexes yeah. or just copied from the previous slide. Um, but, I mean, you can kind of see this whole idea of that um, that aortic outflow tract variation. You know, this is the Doppler packet. So um, I can't tell if it's a pulse gate on that teeny little image. It, it looks like pulse, but yeah. So there's a pulse gate on the aortic outflow tract, and it's showing that decrease in velocity uh, of blood flow from beat to beat with inspiration and expiration. Um, and this is kind of where we get back, you know, if we want to bring things full circle, right? This is where we get back to that whole concept of pulses paradoxes, right? Because this is pulses paradoxes right here. Like this is what we're looking at. Uh, we're not hooked up to a blood pressure machine. We're, we're looking at a, a velocity machine. Um, and actually, you know, it just occurred to me, we could probably pretty easily with some math, convert this velocity into a pressure. Now it wouldn't equal the blood pressure, yeah. but now we're talking about the same units in, in physics, right? If, if so, you use continuous wave Doppler, you can actually convert that to blood pressure too. Okay. By 4V squared plus uh, the C, the left atrial pressure. So yeah. Yeah. But this is pulse wave Doppler. Yeah. So, and so this kind of gets back to that phenomenon of like, as you breathe in, as you breathe out, you're going to change the flow through a valve, right? This is the third valve that we're looking at. Um, and it's going to, you know, basically be correspondent to like what we may feel like if you palpate that radial pulse or that carotid pulse or something like that, this is going to be the Doppler visualization of that. And we don't have a number. We tried looking this up a little bit earlier. We don't have a number. I think the best we can come up with is just significant changes. But I think if we're doing, if we're at this level, right, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Ashish, but if we're at this level, trying to get a number out of aortic outflow variation, uh, and we've done everything else, we've kind of uh, amassed enough data to to call yeah. cardiology i think <laughs> yeah i think you have <laughs> at that point the 2 a.m phone call hey you got a tap in that case in the emergency room yeah that's not a call any interventionist look forward looks forward to i'm not an interventionist so you're not going to wake me up <laughs> these calls. that's why we get you on so that we can have these conversations yeah, and we, right. we affect all your colleagues yeah um one other question that i had and then maybe we can open it up to some questions from the audience um, so here we're talking about velocities, right? So peak velocities from baseline to the, the highest point, right? Yeah. Or if the, here the baseline's inverted, so it's going to be a negative peak velocity, but it's just a math equation at that point. You just put a negative positive sign. Yeah. Um, but we also kind of think about cardiac output in terms of volume, right? And so velocity doesn't equal volume. In fact, velocity can't even be converted to volume necessarily because you, you know, like you said, the uh, the equation, the modified Bernoulli equation gets you to pressure, right? Mm -hmm. So the volume measurement that I have in my mind, right, is VTI, at mm -hmm. least gets you a cross-sectional area. Then you sure. do your math and figure out your orifice size and kind of get your, the whole cone volume. Yep. Um, so yes, it's more complicated, technically to produce this thing, but can we get the same effects 
maybe with slightly different, you know, variation numbers, we could yeah. get the same effects if we'd measured a VTI through each of these valves. Yeah. So I, actually the pulse wave Doppler here is VTI, right? Assuming that the LVOT is, uh, is being measured accurately mm -hmm. and the, 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 the positioning of the pulse wave Doppler volume is not changing, which it does change with the, with the cardiac cycle. Uh, these are actual changes in cardiac output mm -hmm. to beat, right? Yes. So these are different stroke volumes. And essentially, it's the same thing, right? So you just have to trace around and get the VTI on each of these beats. Essentially, that is a very good surrogate of the cardiac output. So the only difference is that for a cardiac output calculation, technically, you need 60 of these beats, and then you average them, and then you multiply them, and you get your... your cardiac output per minute. But what's much more accurate in this setting is a stroke volume, which changes with every beat. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing your pulse paradox measurement, you put on the blood pressure cuff the old fashioned way. And what you you start listening for the crock cuff sounds. Um, when you first hear any sounds is when you start recording the pressure at that number. And then you let the cuff deflate. And when you start hearing sounds that are both systolic and diastolic is when you actually do your second measurement and then your third measurement is done when all the sounds disappear. So in your usual blood pressure measurement, your blood pressure is when the sounds appear and when the sounds disappear. What happens in tamponade patients is that you have unpaired sounds towards the beginning and then they become paired. Normally they're all paired because you don't have tamponade in normal individuals. So the difference uh, the pressure difference between when the sounds start and when they become paired is your paradox. Mm -hmm. And if it is more than 10 millimeters of mercury is when you um, start sus getting suspicious of cardiac tamponade, of course, in the setting of a significant pericardial effusion. Um, above a pressure drop of 20 millimeters of mercury, the pulse will often disappear. So the tamponade or the pulse's paradoxes actually becomes palpable. But before that, you can use the blood pressure cuff. And we do that in clinical exam uh, to actually make a diagnosis of clinical tamponade because echocardiographic tamponade does not equal clinical tamponade. So that's also important to know. All right. Um, so uh, I guess one other comment that I wanted to, to make, I know you and I were talking about this a little bit earlier, uh, just to further kind of dig into this VTI thing um, and why it works to use a surrogate for stroke volume, in, in this case, the um, the max velocity, is because from beat to beat, right, we're not having a dynamic change of the opening of that valve, right? Yeah. Now, if we did a measurement on me yeah. and they did a measurement on you yeah. and then calculate the percent difference, that would be meaningless because our, our valve openings are, are very much different, right? Yeah. Yeah. If we even did me and then a year later did another one of me, hopefully it's the same, but yeah. you know, it, it there's too much variability there for it yeah. to... Yeah. So the reason why this works, why you can use a surrogate as opposed to the the actual volume number, is the fact that we're making the assumption that that valve doesn't change. Correct. Um, and because and so since that doesn't change, we can reliably say this this velocity and this velocity, you know, we're going to correlate those two or, yeah. or, or compare those two. Sure, so absolutely. Um, so great. Um, so basically, just to wrap things up from our end, just as a summary, and then maybe we'll open up for some questions here. Um, we talked a little bit about this whole idea of cardiac tamponade, right? And so it's putting volume, putting something that exerts pressure inside the pericardial space, decreasing filling of the heart, right? And then you can't get cardiac output from the heart, uh, either on the right side or on the left side, you know, or both if you're in late stages. Um, and then the physiology that's been been known for a long time, right? The, I mean, we're going back into these named findings, right? The Bex triad to kind of diagnose it with a, a stethoscope, Um you know, pre-echo days, right? And then kind of this pulses paradox is like, this is the tools that were available to people, you know, years ago. Now we've superimposed on top of that, this, that, on top of that, like this echo machine, right? The ultrasound machine that we have. And now we can see the physiology that underlies all of those things, right? And so in principle, while the sensitivity and specificity of each one isolated just in the wild is, is probably not great, right? when we start applying it to the right patient, right? Doing it the right way that it gets better. But then when we superimpose this echo on top of it, we can still see the physiology is the exact same, right? Um, and now we see it on the screen and we can get some better numbers, you know, with pretty decent sensitivities and specificities to 
to make this diagnosis. And so the whole concept of ventricular interdependence is at the core, one of the factors that causes the the phenomenon that we call tamponade, right? Um, And so we're assessing that through our tricuspid, our mitral, potentially our aortic valve, in terms of looking at that variation with inspiration and expiration. 